So I'm here with Jeffrey Rosen, head of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. And we're continuing to talk about Article 2 of the U.S. Constitution, which talks about the powers of the president. And now we're going to focus a little bit on the first part of Section 2, which talks about, uh, among other things, the, that the president shall be the commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy of the United States, essentially the military of the United States. And you know, this seems like there's a, a bit of a balance here because in Article 1, which describes the powers of the Congress in Section 8, it says the Congress shall have power, and it, it starts listing a bunch of stuff, but one, a bunch of things, but one of the things that it lists is the power to declare war, grant letters of mark, of mark and reprisal, and make rules concerning captures on land and water. So how do these two things fit together, Jeffrey? Well, they've led to the most uh, dramatic constitutional controversies in American history. As, as Justice Robert Jackson put it in the Steel Seizure case, these cryptic words of the Commander-in-Chief Clause have given rise to some of the most persistent controversies in our constitutional history. Everyone agrees that Congress has the power to declare war, and once war is declared, the president has total control over the conduct of the war. There's civilian control of the military. There's a single leader once the war starts. But how the president can act to deploy the troops in the face of emergencies when Congress is silent and how much Congress can constrain his power has led to rise to some huge constitutional controversies. And the steel seizure case that you talk about, this was in 1952. This was uh, arguably talking about uh, the Korean War. What was the context there? Why, why did this need to be ruled on? Well, it's an amazing case. And the steel companies are going to go on strike. And President Truman decides this is a threat to national security because the army needs steel to conduct the Korean War. So he decides on his own, without congressional authorization, to seize the steel mills as part of his authority, his military authority, as commander in chief. And this goes up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court strikes him down. They say he can't seize the steel mills on his own. So Truman is shocked. He's appointed many of the justices. But the most influential opinion in the steel seizure case is the concurring opinion by Justice Robert Jackson. And I want our listeners to go check it out on the web because it's so important. And Justice Jackson identified three categories of executive power that every law student learns, and they're, they're easy to remember. Basically, when the president acts with congressional approval, his authority is at its height. When he acts in the face of congressional disapproval, his authority is at its lowest ebb. And when Congress has neither approved or disapproved, the president acts in a zone of twilight, as Justice Jackson said. <laughs> it sounds like the twilight zone, and I always think of that music, do 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 But it means that in the steel seizure case, although the, uh, Congress had not um, authorized the seizure, and the president had no civilian authority to seize the steel mills, so he had no independent authority to rely on in the zone of twilight, and therefore the, co the court held he acted unconstitutionally. And Truman's argument might have been, hey, look, the Constitution makes me the commander in chief. Uh, if I read that broadly, I should be able to do whatever I need to execute in times of war. Steel is a very important input into making uh, the things that you need to execute your war with. And so if they're going to go on strike, that's going to keep me from uh, being able to uh, conduct our war. That's exactly right. That's just what he argued. And although some justices bought it, including Justice uh, Chief Justice Fred Vinson, whom Truman had appointed, uh, a majority of the Supreme Court said that civilian power over the military doesn't authorize the president to use his power in the United States in ways that might be helpful to the war effort. He needs explicit congressional approval uh, for that. It really upset President Truman. He invited the whole Supreme Court. Uh, they, they actually invited him for drinks at Justice Hugo Black's house after the decision came down. And Truman sulked for a while and he said, Hugo, I don't think much of your law, but by golly, this bourbon is good. So they kind of <laughs> they made up after the case. <laughs> <laughs> and, and another, I, I guess, relevant, this isn't a, a case, but a resolution, is the War Powers Resolution 1973, historical context. Uh, we're nearing the end of the Vietnam War. What, what was the background there? Well, Congress was very upset that President Nixon had sent bombers into Cambodia without congressional approval. And there had been other disputes about the president's power in Vietnam. Uh, so Congress decided to try to codify exactly when the president could act to repel sudden attacks, which everyone agrees that he has the right to do. Uh, so Congress said, President, you've got to notify us within 48 hours of the time that you send troops on your own, and you can only keep those troops on the ground for 30 days, uh, except under extraordinary circumstances. Um, otherwise, you need congressional approval. 
So despite this effort to kind of set out congressional approval for these extraordinary situations, some presidents have argued that the War Powers Resolution itself is unconstitutional as a violation of the president's commander-in-chief power. Others on the other side have said Congress is ceding too much power to the president, but so far the Supreme Court has not struck down the War Powers Resolution, and presidents are supposed to abide by it, although sometimes they haven't. President Bill Clinton sent troops into Kosovo without following the War Powers Resolution and notifying Congress. What's the argument uh, that a president would make that the war pro uh that the war powers, or anyone could make, that the war powers resolution is unconstitutional, that somehow conflicts with Section 2? The argument is that the president's unitary authority under Article 2 gives him complete power uh, as commander-in-chief to conduct military operations as he thinks best, and that includes the ability to send troops into the field, uh, despite the explicit provision in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution that says that Congress has the power to declare war. So the unitary executive uh, people and, and President George W. Bush's administration uh, claim this explicitly, say that the president basically can do whatever he thinks is necessary to preserve national security. That led, um, after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, of um, other presidents, including um, President Obama said that because of the commander-in-chief clause, various attempts by Congress to limit the president's unitary authority were unconstitutional. Um, and the Bush administration said the forbidding of torture of detainees, warrantless surveillance, the detention of U.S. citizens as enemy combatants, all of these were um, unconstitutional. The Supreme Court rejected many of those claims, including most famously in the Hamdan and Rumsfeld case in 2006, where the court said that the president could not set up military tribunals without congressional authorization. So the big lesson from all these cases is that when the president acts side by side with Congress, then the Supreme Court tends to uphold executive power. But when the president acts unilaterally on his own, especially in the face of congressional disapproval, the Supreme Court is likely to slap him down. But across all of this, there is a, even though these cases, especially the ones we cite, seem to limit presidential uh, authority to some degree, there's this general notion even our, our founding fathers thought of, which is, yes, you, the Congress has the power to declare war, but uh, as the commander in chief, what if we're suddenly attacked by someone? Obviously, you don't want to go through the process of getting all the congressmen together and to vote. You need to be able to act quickly. So it has always been understood that uh, as commander in chief, the president could uh, engage in, in conflict quite quickly. No question about it. And presidents uh, have done so from the beginning. The Response to 9-11 is a famous example as well. But uh, many of the framers thought that Congress's approval was necessary for serious wars. The War of 1812, there was a former declaration, but there were lesser uses of force like the war with France in 1798, conflict with the Barbary states in Tripoli and Algeria, conflict with Native American tribes. All of these are approved by Congress, although without formal declarations. In the modern era, though, things have really changed, and presidents have used military force without express consent from Congress on lots of occasions. The Korean War, Libya, Grenada, Lebanon, Panama, Noriega, um, all of these are, uh, are cases where uh, the president has used uh, force without congressional authorization, and we haven't had a formal declaration of war since World War II. I mean, that statement, I think, is worth writing down. That's why I'm <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's write it down. <laughs> since since World War II. I mean, when I when you say that, um, to me it's like, well, what's it, it it kind of feels like, well, we've clearly had what you and I would consider wars since World War II, Korea, Vietnam War, obviously uh, post 9/11, what happened in Afghanistan, we have the Iraq War, actually we have both the Iraq wars. Um, and you've had all sorts of military action about, you know, whether it's, we're talking about drone strikes or uh, kind of kind of very uh, surgical interventions. And all of those were done without a, a, a formal declaration of war by Congress. So to what degree does this even matter anymore? It seems like in modern times, um, presidents are able to do what they, they need to do militarily. Well, that seems right. Now, that's not to say Congress hasn't acted. Many of the wars we've talked about have had informal statutory authorization, including most famously recently, the authorization of the use of military force after 9-11, which was said to authorize a lot of what happened after 9-11, and it's now contested whether that continues to authorize the war not against al-Qaeda, which it was originally passed for, but also against ISIS. But it certainly seems to be the case that formal declarations of war have now been replaced with these more informal uh, 
authorizations or even with presidential unilateral action. And I guess maybe one argument there is that uh, in some of these wars, it, it gives more flexibility to the president to be flexible, and there might not even be a state to declare war against. That's true, although there have been a bunch of these wars where there are clear states, Korea, Libya, Granada, Lebanon. Um, more literalist conceptions of the president say the president could have and should have asked for formal declarations of war, but that's not the way that the modern executive has evolved. Fascinating. Well, well thanks so much, Jeffrey. This, this is really informative. Thanks. It's a pleasure to talk.